to use uh, uh, to indicate or to measure whether we are going to do well or not. And that is called GDP growth. In the 2021 national budget, uh, the finance minister projected a 7.4 percentage growth of GDP. Uh, this is against other projections by the likes of World Bank and other multilateral institutions. The World Bank in particular estimates that the economy will grow by around 2.9% uh, in 2021. There is an assumption that economic growth uh, translates into more incomes into the pockets of the people. Those that narrations will be debated, but that for another day. Uh, so in my own view, I think we are anticipating much gold output increase and also the gold prices on the international market have been firming up and that will give a plus to our GDP developments in this country, that's one. Then secondly, I think we are also likely to witness a decent harvest this year from an agricultural perspective and thanks to the good rains uh, that are pouring all over the nation. And that will also give a plus to our GDP growth. However, we have got a one serious downside effect, which is uh, the consumption side. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the COVID-19 induced lockdowns, you discover that most companies or entities that rely heavily on domestically driven consumption who suffer a huge knock during 2021. So I see our economy growing more directly by an average of 3% uh, during the year 2021, driven by agriculture and mining, but with a very huge knock on the consumptive side of the economy. Then if you also look at another indicator, which most people also want to use to measure whether we're doing well or not, which is the inflation development, the minister projects that will close the year at around 135% uh, inflation. In my view, I think this is very much achievable. But achievable on the basis of repressive local demand due to depleting incomes in the pockets of many during, due to inactivity, due to the corona pandemic. So I think the corona issue will become a very huge determining factor uh, when it comes to GDP development as well as inflationary development. Let me talk about another indicator, which is called the exchange rate, which uh, I think has been in the uh, 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 lips of many people for a very long period uh, in this country. And let me please my statement on the exchange rate dynamics to say, I think in Zimbabwe, we've suffered a long period of exchange rates, manipulate, manipulation and experimentation as a country. Prior to the period leading to 2009, I think there was a lot of exchange rate manipulation and experimentation. And also that exchange rate activism is much, much uh, from 2016 onwards. And right now, we are talking of this Dutch auction system administered by uh, the RRBC. We can debate whether it's really an auction system or a rationing system. But for the purposes of this debate, let's call it uh, an auction system. I think what we are evidently seeing uh, there is the, you are seeing an exchange rate that has been uh, kind of stable uh, for a number of months now. Whether that stability is artificial or genuine is something that I'll, I'll, I'll try to unpick here. But let me say the exchange rate per se is a symptom or a reflection of what happens in the real economy. I called, I, I just did a small uh, calling before coming to this debate to find out how the exchange rate is spanning out on the black market. And I discovered that for one to access a dollar US to uh, a one US dollar, you have to fork out around 120 uh, Zimbabwean dollars. Against an official weighted average rate of around 82, 82 dollars. So you can actually see that there is a widening disparity, the widening gap between the official rates and what is obtaining in the parallel market rate. That tell is, tells you that something is, 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 is not balancing, balancing up. 
Myself, I am a proponent uh, of uh, 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 the idea that the exchange rate should be left to find its own level. This whole idea of trying to manipulate the exchange rate and try to uh, uh, portray some semblance of stability, which is not stability, will actually lead to a point of explosion in the near future. Somebody, somewhere, is actually bearing the blunt of that, uh, of that stability and that peg. And we know who people are. These are our exporters who are actually bearing uh, the blunt of that kind of uh, semi-fixed exchange, exchange rate regime. Now, let me talk about my view on uh, sectoral developments. I foresee that the mining sector will continue to boom, will continue to grow. I don't see the COVID-19 pandemic really affecting the mining sector in a big way. Agriculture, like I said before, is also promising, but we have got other sectors who are actually probably on a deathbed. Uh, for, for instance, the tourism sector, I think it's hardly hit uh, this uh, corona pandemic. Uh, so we also see probably a huge growth in what is called the knowledge economy. Uh, uh, given the details and the requirements of the situation that we are actually living in at the particular moment. Then the other issue, uh, which probably is key uh, in shaping uh, the fortunes of our economy in the year 2021, is our ability to attract foreign funding. I think it's now common knowledge that uh, the cost of borrowing in this country is called is, is skyrocketed, and the most borrowing is actually not productive borrowing that's happening at the moment. So our ability to be able also to tap into cheap external finance will be critical in terms of stimulating growth and productivity in this country. Personally, I am a proponent of Islamic financing. If you look at the Middle East for per se, it's, it's a region that does not grow anything. And if you look at Zimbabwe, we have got vast amounts of arable land, so we have got fairly decent climatic conditions. I think we have got a window of opportunity to tap into Middle East financing uh, and put that man into particular agriculture and agro-processing, as well as also then service the uh, Middle East market in terms of provision of food and so forth. I think uh, it's something which is an opportunity for us to tap into uh, in 2021 and going and going forward. If you look at our industry uh, as measured by uh, capacity utilization, you discover that capacity utilization is actually going down. It is actually going down because of one, historical reasons. Access to finance, markets, uh, obsolete equipment, you can talk about all those things which can summarily be said as a high cost of doing business. But also you see that our capacity utilization industry is going down because of a new repression in aggregate demand. People are not spending because they do not have money. The majority of people are, are, are actually earning very little uh, uh, salaries. Hence that is repressing aggregate demand and that is also causing a knock effect on our uh, industry uh, in terms of uh, their ability to sell and produce. And that's, that's another thing. Then also, if you look at uh, uh, the 2021 national budget, like I said before, contrary to what other countries are doing, they are, they, they, uh, they are printing, they are, they are borrowing in order to sustain jobs, in order to sustain their social amenities and everything else. If you look here, Zimbabwe, yes, uh, the minister presented a huge budget, but that budget is primarily financed from domestic taxation. So what it means is we are squeezing this person called Zimbabwe uh, in terms of taxing them more and more. And as a result, we are leaving very little for them to spend. And as a result, aggregate demand takes an effect. When it takes a knock, it then affects the, uh, the ability of the uh, companies to also boom it. So we, then come, uh, we are faced with this jigsaw where we actually probably need some external stimulus to be able to break it and provide external uh, uh, impetus to it. Let me conclude by saying, I see us as a country uh, taking what I can define as a random walk. Uh, we are just walking, 
And see, the corona effect has actually made the situation worse. It has become very uncertain. For the past 22 months, for instance, if you take the past 22 months, for instance, I think we have seen a lot of uh, distortions in developments. If you look at the monetary perspective, you've seen launch of FCA nostrils. There's what for the domestic nostril, there's what for the foreign nostril. Actually, it's boggling to try and understand what the difference is. Uh, my perspective is to actually say probably the domestic nostril is a fake a US dollar account because there is not much that you can actually do with that in terms of US dollar terms. You can also, you've also seen some shifts in terms of the crawling pair, you've seen a fixed parity in terms of the exchange rate, you've seen numerous new controls and regulations in the form of numerous SIEs. We have now the Dutch auction system, but all if you, if you look at all these things, there is a one emerging denominator. Everything is culminating into creeping re-dollarization. So we can safely, I can safely conclude that uh, the Zim economy is very much geared towards re-dollarization, contrary to what is the policy prescription, at least on paper, uh, by, by, by the authorities. So I think this is the scenario that we see ourselves in as a country. 2021 is not necessarily going to be rosier. It is bumpy. There are a lot of external and internal constraints. The COVID-19 pandemic, which I've mentioned, there is the issue of the police environment, which is not yet sanitized, which we need to deal with. There is the auction system, which we also need to sanitize and are able to allow the exchange rate to find its own level than to pretend as if things have stabilized it, they are not stabilized. Then there is the whole issue of the real economy where we need to produce and produce, but the biggest threat is now the most diving in aggregate demand. I think I'll stop there and see, I'll allow others to come in. Thank you, MQ. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, that was Kipson Kundani, who is the CEO of CEO Africa Roundtable Forum. Um, thank you very much, Kipson, for that presentation. Thank you for your um, um, thoughts that you have shared, and uh, they are very hard hitting, um, ladies and gentlemen. But um, if there's one thing that all our panelists have in common is that they have very strong views regarding the prospects of the Zimbabwean economy and uh, what it is that we can expect in um, 2021. Um, he has shared with us, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the economy is slowly dollarizing. And uh, he's also shared his own views regarding the local nostril. But uh, let me not preempt uh, what the other panelists will share. Um, thank you so much, Kipson. You may go ahead and, and mute your mic and uh, disable your video. Um, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is um, Honorable Eddie Cross, who is a member of parliament and also a member of the Reserve Bank Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, Mr. Cross, you may go ahead um, and share your presentation for um, our participants who are joining us on Facebook Live and also on YouTube and here, of course, on our Zoom platform. Please may you proceed and mute your mic and show your video and go ahead with your presentation. Um, thank you. Mr. Eddie Cross, you may go ahead with your presentation, sir. Technical team, please unmute him. Thank you. Right. Um, my 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 mute would not unmute. They, it said to me that uh, you guys controlled it. <clears throat> okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. Lovely to see you and uh, uh, everybody on the line. I see we have close to a hundred participants this morning. <clears throat> I think that's very, very satisfactory. Um, uh, making economic forecasts is never easy. And it's contingent upon so many different things. 
Um, but I think for me, um, I'm fairly optimistic about 2021. And uh, when I look at the performance of the economy in the last quarter of last year, I see a significant upsurge in domestic e economic activity. I see industrial, um, industrial activity uh, growing. Um, I would estimate today that at least 40%, maybe even higher, 45% of all goods that are being marketed in the local market are now sourced locally. Percentage of were about 5%. So we're seeing quite significant industrial growth. Um, on the auction every week, uh, we're now allocating about $35 million. And about 50% of that is going to raw materials. And a significant proportion is going to machinery and equipment, both of which indicate that the productive sector in the in, in the domestic market actually is, is doing I think also on the export side, you would have seen that the results for the last quarter of last year, exports rose by 20%. And uh, the strong growth really has persisted throughout the year. In the international market, uh, the mineral side is all strengthening. Uh, we have commodity prices rising really across the board internationally. And uh, that I think is going to continue in 2021. And it's driven mainly by increasing demand from the Middle East, particularly from the Far East, uh, particularly China, where uh, consumption seems to have returned to normal. Um, on the Um, Honorable Cross, we seem to have um, lost you there. I think uh, he is facing technical challenges with his internet connection. Uh, please bear with us if he may rejoin the meeting. And ladies and gentlemen, we are streaming live on uh, the Heart and Soul Facebook page. Uh, please feel free to let your friends and colleagues know who uh, wanting to join us on the Zoom platform that if our Zoom platform is full, they are able to join us on the Facebook page and follow proceedings on the Facebook page. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please bear with us as we uh, wait for Honorable Cross to rejoin the meeting. Thank you. Um, apologies, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have lost um, Honorable Eddie Cross. Um, maybe we can move on to our next speaker while he attempts to rejoin um, our Zoom platform. And uh, please note, ladies and gentlemen, we will share the Facebook page um, details so that uh, you may also share in your various social media platforms for our friends and colleagues who are trying to join the Zoom platform so that we may free up space and have Honorable Eddie Cross rejoin the meeting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our next panelist whom I would like to invite is uh, Mrs. Gloria Zaravanu, who is the CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe. Uh, welcome, ma'am, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Nobile, and um, thank you, AMH, for having me on this debate. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, certainly, um, 
our times and the outlook have really been clouded by this COVID-19. And uh, no doubt that every one of us has either been infected or closely affected by this pandemic. Um, but just coming to this debate, I think it sort of helps us to come back into perspective and think about the future and the outlook of our country and hopefully help us tap into any opportunities that you know might be available for us as we discuss in this debate. So I proudly represent the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe. And uh, naturally, I was asked to comment on the 2021 national budget and highlight the key issues that will affect the economic outlook um, from our perspective. So um, as we reviewed the 2021 national budget and its impact on the economy, we focused on its ability uh, to deliver on um, the following five key issues. Uh, the first one being its ability to achieve the projected economic growth of 7.4% in this first year of the national development strategy. The second point was its ability to achieve a decline in inflation, which is expected to end uh, this year on a year-on-year -year inflation of 135%. And we also looked at the impact it might have on exchange rate management. Uh, fourthly, where, how uh, the outturn or the budgeted outturn uh, will be managed. And lastly, foreign debt management and investment attraction as the budget statement was speaking to us. So I'll take those points uh, in turn. So starting with the first one, which is whether or not we felt that the budget um, you know, was well placed to achieve the budgeted economic growth. Um, I think there were a couple of positives that we picked out from the budget statement itself. Um, the first being that there were improved uh, growth prospects in the mining and uh, agricultural sectors, uh, also arising from the fact that the stabilization and framing of commodity prices in the international markets, in particular gold, um, as well as the anticipated good agricultural uh, season. Um, the dual currency, which was also introduced, reintroduced rather in the year uh, in 2020, also introduces some microeconomic class stability. Uh, the upward review of some tax thresholds and tax free brands also resulted in some increase in disposable income uh, for individuals, though we do know that the key variable there is inflation. So, inflation, if it moves and runs away, then that um, positive is also taken away unless those thresholds are, are adjusted. There were also a couple of measures um, um, that were introduced to support industry uh, in the budget. Um, in particular, there was extension of duty on suspension of new product, extension of duty suspension on uh, ring fence quantities of cheese, expansion of the list of materials that qualify under the shoe manufacturer's rebate, um, extension of duty suspension for motor vehicles and bus importation under the safari and tour operators, ETCC. Um, there were also projected disbursements in the budget uh, for ongoing projects in power, airports, uh, social safety nets, small, smallholder, telecoms projects, as well as projects in mining. And um, the agreed commodities exchange is also expected to improve um, the viability of farmers. So those were some of the positive things that would work towards achieving that sort of growth uh, from the budget. But we do know that there are negatives that will play against that and um, we sort of take away uh, from those positives. One of the key challenges we have is um, the challenge in raising capital in the key export any mining sector, and that will naturally affect productivity of that particular sector. We also have issues of country negative perception and exchange rate regulations, which affect foreign direct investment attraction into those same key productive sectors that need uh, capital from FDI. Our budget um, is also lacking budgetary support. It's weak, and there's also limited funding sources. I think it's on, uh, touched on the fact that most of the tax is coming from um, yeah, domestic um, expenditure. Um, private consumption itself is likely to be depressed due to low disposable incomes. And I think the fact that we still have taxes such, like, such as the IMTT, which also takes away from that available disposable income um, is also one of the factors that will play against um, 
that domestic expenditure. We have in the past experienced uh, serious uh, power cuts that affected industry. I think we still continue to experience erratic supplies of water and electricity, and this will affect um, our industry and ultimately productivity. The disintermediation of the economy due to the growing cash economy is also a key factor uh, where we have the informal sector largely trading in a foreign currency outside the informal banking sector. They're not in the um, tax net, most of them, so they're not contributing to, 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 to revenue and to the fiscals. Then, of course, COVID-19 uh, has already been shared by Kipson as well. Um, the effects of the lockdowns that we're currently experiencing, the shorter working hours for essential services, and of course, deployment of resources um, at organizational and at government level to combat uh, COVID-19 is also going to affect the outlook in terms of economic growth. So given the above, it might be a tall order to achieve an economic growth that exceeds 3% uh, in 2021 in our view. Then around inflation, the target is to uh, end the year on 135% year on year. Um, and this is from our current 348.59% as at December. Now, traditionally, the biggest drivers of inflation in Zimbabwe have been money supply growth and the exchange rate. Um, so as long as those two are maintained um, and the auction system works, continues to work or works or meets uh, most of the demands for Forex in the market, um, then we will see, we will like, likely see uh, inflation being tamed. But I think we'll hear more from um, Honorable Eddie Cross on how um, the issue of the exchange rate is going to be managed going forward. The dual price economy and direct importation are likely to see a stabilization of prices in USD. Um, but what might work against the inflation target is tax-induced uh, upward adjustment of consumer goods uh, arising from changes such as the review of the presumptive, presumptive tax structure and the increase on excise duty on diesel, as well as the planned legged increases in utilities and public services that we alluded to in the budget statement. So my conclusion on inflation is that um, we're coming off a high base in terms of CPI. So mathematically, it's easy for us to achieve a slowdown in inflation as to whether we achieve the actual target at 135%. Uh, I think it remains to be seen. Definitely, it will be a happy day for us accountants if we can get rid of hyperinflation as it is such an unnecessary burden uh, on reporting. On exchange rate management, I won't say much because I know that it will be articulated much, much more um, by, by Eddie. Um, but when we look at um, the dual currency and increased dollarization, it's likely to reduce pressure on exchange rate, causing some stability. I think that we sort of saw in the last quarter of uh, 2020. So the management of money supply and effective auction system will positively contribute um, to the exchange rate. But of course, there are downsides and the lack of balance of payment support, increase in foreign um, surrender rates to 40%. Those things are going to increase foreign currency demand and also general increase in forex demand if the economy grows as anticipated and as it opens up. So the exchange rate is currently expected to remain stable at about 18, 20, 21. Um, if on the auction system, but you know, the, the t we will tell between the gap um, between that auction rate and the parallel market, I think will be the teller as the year goes. In terms of managing budgeted outturn or the possibility of achieving the actual budgeted uh, amounts there in terms of revenue collections and expenditure, so our budgeted revenues for 2021, um, 390 billion SIM dollars from, um, <clears throat> from 173 billion that is um, uh, for 2020. And in US dollars, that's 4.9 billion um, from 2.1, that's on the revenue side. And then on expenditure, uh, we are projecting 421 billion. Um, from 178 billion 2020, and in USD terms, that will be 5.3 billion USD uh, from 2.2. 2. 
Now, those figures appear quite optimistic in revenue terms, particularly in US dollars. If we're looking at a target of achieving 4.9 billion in 2021, when we picked a 3.9 billion in the whole dollarization era, I think this, this brings about a bit of uh, skepticism as to whether we're able to achieve such, um, such numbers now when we know that the economy has shrunk. There's also a high risk of budget overrun uh, by ministries. Uh, that, and that's because the expenditure bids exceeded um, the revenue. So it's very likely um, that we'll see budget overruns there. There's some projected um, development aid inflows of about 841 million in US dollars. But we do know that this might be affected by COVID developments, um, you know, as resources might be channeled towards um, combating um, COVID-19. So we have limited funding options for the budget. Um, the revenue is mainly coming from increased taxation of the formal sector, which is the sector that is going to be most affected um, by COVID-19 developments. We also really do have um, a significant informal market in Zimbabwe, or a shadow economy as we might call it. And in 2018, the IMF estimated that 60% um, of Zim is informal. So this means those that mostly trade in foreign currency outside formal banking channels. And it remains to be seen um, how the presumptive tax structures which were introduced uh, will work uh, for revenue collection in this year. My last point will be on the foreign debt management and investment uh, attraction. Um, external debt um, was estimated at about 8.2 billion US dollars at the time of budgeting in, in September, October uh, 2020. And we were sitting on areas of 6.3 billion. And um, that would be 71% of the total debt, so quite high. And we are aware that uh, we are off track in terms of the IMF staff uh, monitored program. Um, and we think that it's important for Zimbabwe to join the community of nations <clears throat> and secure funding from the IMF. Um, we think it's imperative that we try to achieve the SMP uh, milestones uh, and it should remain a focus for the authorities um, over and above and looking lines of credit uh, in the long run. This will help in promoting investor confidence uh, in the short term. We also need investment friendly policies. We didn't quite see a lot of this um, in the budget statement. Um, speaking for my own profession, I know you know we were plunged in serious um, qualified opinions in this country since 2018 uh, as a result of policies around exchange control. And you know, adhering to international standards of reporting is critical as global investors like familiarity. They like comparability. And so qualified opinions take that away and makes the bubble less, less attractive uh, for investment. So we're hoping for policies that support us to ensure that we also report um, favorably. The impact of the Africa Free Trade Agreement um, that came into force on 1 January 2021. It was in fact supposed to come into effect in July, I think, 2020 but had to be postponed because of COVID. Now, this agreement um, will help in reducing tariffs among member countries, cover policy areas, such a trade facilitation, and the, it's such a major opportunity to diversify exports, to accelerate growth, and attract FDI. But Zim is unlikely to immediately benefit from this. We didn't see anything that um, uh, talked to our preparedness and our readiness to tap into this opportunity uh, in the budget statement. Uh, so this is an opportunity that remains untapped unless we work on um, our competitiveness because at the moment we are net importers. So um, as I conclude, I just want to take this opportunity to discuss some of the accounting matters that was raised um, by the Public Accountants and Auditors Board in their communication of um, 14 January 2021 pertaining to the 2021 reporting season. And this communique was intended to help in robust reporting 
uh, given the many economic uncertainties arising from COVID-19 and the other than specific economic matters that I've discussed above or will be discussed later on. So if you have not seen that communication, please do visit the ICAS website, you'll find uh, the communication, but it was talking to the impact of um, re remote working and travel restrictions, which will impact audits and likely stretch reporting timetables. And therefore the sector regulators are also to be mindful of this and setting realistic reporting deadlines. Entities are also to consider the impact of COVID-19 on their liquidity risk, uh, on their going concern, and sustainability of their businesses in general. And this will it require elaborate disclosures in financial statements on these matters, so that investors and other users of these financial statements um, are well informed of the health of the companies. There's, all need, uh, there's also need for entities to reflect on whether their uh, functional currency changed during the year, given the change in ex exchange control regulations that saw the use of the USD being uh, permitted again during the course of 2020. So that whole process of checking uh, the functional currency changes and reporting accordingly uh, is critical. The communication offered um, some guidance as well on new reporting standards that are effective for this reporting season, and it urged entities to fully consider and disclose impact of this. Now, as you know, ICAS has over the year also been issuing papers and guidance on the same, and material can also be found um, on our website to assist in this. Um, normally, I think I'll end here for now. And also just in general, I was on mute, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Jaravanu. That was a very um, excellent presentation. Um, thank you for sharing uh, the views from um, the side of our chartered accountants. And also just in general, um, giving um, insights on uh, the prospects for our economy for 2021. And you also highlighted, as Kipson had done as well, regarding the COVID pandemic and the impact um, that the lockdown is going to have on um, how our economy is going to um, go forward. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to our next speaker, who is um, Honorable Tendai Biti. We are still trying to get um, Honorable Cross back onto our platform. And when he is back, we will proceed with his presentation. But for now, we will hear from um, Honorable Tendai Biti, who is, of course, a renowned lawyer and also a former Minister of Finance and Economic Development. And um, he is also a part of um, the political sphere in our country as a member of uh, the Movement for Democratic Change. Honorable Tendai Biti, you may proceed to un to with your presentation and if the technical team may unmute his mic and he may proceed with his presentation thank you okay ladies and gentlemen i am receiving a message that he is not yet in our zoom platform um, as we had advised earlier ladies and gentlemen we are of course streaming live on heart and soul tv so those of you who are trying to get into our Zoom platform may, of course, join and follow the debate on the Heart and Soul Zoom, um, sorry, Heart and Soul Facebook page. Uh, we move on, ladies and gentlemen, to our next speaker, who is Dr. Nigel Chanakira. Dr. Chanakira, I know you are on the Zoom platform. 
you may proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, along with uh, all the attendees to this uh, big debate. Uh, you can pick me up clearly. Um, I'm president of the Zimbabwe Economic Society, and uh, we were fortunate to participate much earlier on um, or later, late last year, in the budget debates uh, that were taking place uh, with the minister, along with the parliamentarians. And so I think at that juncture, uh, we were fairly optimistic that uh, the growth and uh, opening up of the economy that we had seen in the final quarter of the year would actually continue through into um, the first quarter and then of course um, on into the year. So I think going back on the um, general economic outlook, I think I am inclined now to be a lot more conservative than uh, I was uh, late last year. Uh, clearly the revision downwards that uh, colleagues have indicated, um, both Gloria and uh, Kipston, that 7.4% uh, GDP, even though we're coming off a low base where we had receded about 4%, uh, in the previous year, 2019 um, or 2020, um, is unlikely to be to be breached unless we see a rapid uh, uh, change. I think we've kind of lost January. Uh, traditionally, January is a slow month, but compounded by a lockdown. So we've got uh, probably about a twelfth of uh, uh, the the, um, the the days to the year or the months to the year uh, already gone. But um, as intimated, agriculture is looking very strong. Um, and uh, this is domestic agriculture along with the region. And that, I think, is a key aspect in terms of the nation being able to feed itself. Uh, the um, harvest on the wheat side, for example, was a, a, a very good indicator of you know, some of the policies that were put into place you know, coming to the fore. And then of course, the very good rainy season that we've had this year and the crop outlook is there, I think is looking fairly good. So my uh, view is that as long as we're able to feed ourselves, we're able to process our food, uh, the value chains around food processing should give a boost. But I think uh, probably we're looking two to three percent in terms of positive GDP in 2021. This is assuming, of course, that COVID is something that we are able to uh, wrestle and bed down and bring it under control so that uh, in the second quarter through to the end of the year, we can see greater, greater production. Uh, globally, of course, there is a slowdown, so we can't see too much in terms of uh, investment uh, appetite uh, from global nations. They're dealing with their own issues, and uh, China particularly is looking fairly attractive. I think they've got a 2.3 uh, GDP, pro uh, GDP projection for 2021. Uh, for them, it's the slowest in three to four decades. Yet, of course, it is a strong signal. So in terms of our own trade activities, which were made mention of earlier on, uh, if we keep up and we are able to export mainly our raw materials in that direction, then the outlook may be a lot better. We've got to be competitive with them. We've got to keep them coming through in terms of investment, uh, as they've done, for example, in the power sector. And all that also allows for what we know to be import substitution in terms of imports on the power side. Um, so generally, I think um, consumption, uh, when you've had an era of hyperinflation to the order of about 400%, then guess what? Uh, real wages are really shot, you know, from the perspective uh, of uh, consumption. 
And so consumption is going to slow down. Uh, my hope and wish is that uh, there would be more competitiveness within the retail sector so that we can keep a tab on inflation. But without investment in the retail sector, without cross-border traders, that really points uh, to the retailers getting a great berth in terms of being able to price things. And they normally are sharp prices uh, of uh, the retail goods. And one is really expecting that with the 40 to 50% premium on the official exchange rate, uh, much is dependent on the allocations to the retail sector, the allocation to the food value chains, for example, so that on the consumption of food processed items, we're able to contain inflation. But generally, of course, uh, we've seen this month in particular, um, the exchange rates start to move, uh, that is unofficially, uh, but the uh, official uh, auction uh, remains fairly static. And so overall, I think if we are to look at the macroeconomic indicators, the projection, by the way, of 135% um, inflation is not by year end. I had to go and check. My colleagues kept saying year end. No, it's actually the average for the year, as stated by the Minister of, of, of Finance. And so we know global inflation is down, uh, but our own inflation sticks out like a sore thumb. And even if you compare it with the benchmarks of the region, where we've got single digit inflation, uh, the likes of Zambia perhaps at 19% is the highest, but we are still hovering at the beginning of the year um, or end of last year, 395%. Uh, it doesn't bode well in terms of consumption perking up. And so real wages are an issue and they have been, and we know that uh, from a consumption uh, perspective, the doctors, the teachers, um, you know, nurses speak of capacitation and that capacitation really speaks to their inability to be able to go to work, to be able to put food on the table, Therefore, they are not able to actively engage in what we know to be basic services, uh, having been hammered by, by inflation. Uh, the pensioners are also suffering. And so, you know, one would hope that negotiations uh, between, for example, within the civil service uh, sends a, sets a better benchmark in terms of, um, you know, wages that are real and would allow people to have some degree of modest consumption. Now, when you throw in the COVID factor, there is that factor of illness, uh, which has become so perversive on the budgets. Uh, there is the aspect of, you know, um, uh, taking care of, uh, you know, the dying, the sick, the ailing, the dying, that all speaks to household consumption being hammered once again and redirected for funerals, uh, medication, uh, and basic care. And that basic care also means, uh, if you look at it, but, uh, diets have, have been altered uh, smartly in the sense that uh, locals are looking more for sliced lemons, they're looking for all manner of concoctions, as it were, to actually be re redirected. In a sense, it's good uh, because improved diets but we need to really be producing within our own households, you know, vegetables and things of that nature and doing home production rather than sit at home so that we may be able to cushion uh, the expenditure. That speaks to health as well uh, in the light of, of COVID. Um, I think overall, um, one of course goes back to from a macroeconomic perspective, the coming in of uh, Professor Mtuling uh, you know, speaks to a degree of fiscal discipline. And of course, proverbially, he wants to balance budgets. He wants to operate beneath the radar. He wants to, uh, as Honorable Beatty would say, in a sense, consume 
you know, eat what he what he kills, uh, so that uh, fiscal expenditure is driven uh, from the revenue model. And so he has tended to be very cautious in terms of uh, expenditure. And that's also been aided uh, in the budget 2020 and certainly looking through to 2021, uh, the crystal ball speaks to less travel, less per diems on the part of uh, say, for example, civil servants. And that therefore then means that there is some room in terms of expenditure. Um, you know, um, that is modest, but not inflationary within itself. And, and all that is, is welcome because unless you can balance your budget, unless you can balance and have a balance on the trade front in terms of your balance of payments, we are likely to run into, you know, major problems of hyperinflating again. And so I think commendations are due to him. I think to some extent, some may feel uh, he's overplayed his hand in not allowing expenditures to go through, for example, to real wages, and then to also speak to um, expenditure on things like health infrastructure uh, nationally, and we are paying the price for it. But we can't pay the price, I guess, when we've got uh, an, you know, a nation that's locked up I think prevention is better than cure. The reality is that our 1,800 hospitals and clinics nationally do not have the capacity you know, to absorb um, a full scale you know, COVID-19 attack. And so this stay at home may look like it's sluggish uh, in so far as its impact on the economy, but uh, certainly, I think the aftermath of full-scale bloodbath as a consequence of 20, uh, sorry, COVID-19, uh, I think would be a total massacre. Already, if we speak to things, um, I've been involved with the um, fight against COVID-19 and uh, some of our activities, uh, therefore, keep me you know, aware of what is going on nationally. And from a national perspective, where the beds were set up for COVID-19 facilities, uh, we basically are only utilizing 27% uh, on average of the infrastructure that we set up. And this speaks to both public in the main and the private sector. Now, if you look at it from that perspective, 27% and already we are told beds are full, 60 beds at Pari against 400 that were actually put in place or at St. Anne's, 30 beds, you know, being utilized in an outfit that has capacity for 220. We must therefore make sure that we've got resources to pay for the software. The software are the people, uh, the nurses, doctors, and frontline staff. And so I would hope that the minister would be able to loosen the purse strings and enable funding, otherwise we will die like flies, you know, from a national perspective. The hardware is there, uh, but, you know, the software just isn't because the presence of doctors, nurses just isn't there. And then while I'm on that, if you look at teachers as well, we could potentially lose a generation in the sense that two years non-schooling, uh, 2020 was a bit of a write-off, if we allow 2021 to be a write-off again, it means kids, uh, the current crop of kids will lose two years education. And so once again, my appeal would be to allow, you know, the expenditure to take place for ICT so that kids can learn online and then that the teachers be paid and, you know, something meaningful. And on the part of the teachers themselves, I'm saying that with all the education that we have, Let's wake up and switch on to e-commerce and teach elsewhere, teach outside of Zimbabwe, because this whole phenomenon is actually global. And so teachers can become forex earners as well, along with our lecturers, uh, you know, in our education institutions. So my hope is that we will be able to resolve that. The other factor that I want to speak to is the whole devolution disbursements per province. If you looked at the budget, 
uh, once again, um, uh, the budget statement, page 144 in the minister's statement, my worry was the budgeted devolution proceeds at um, roughly $2.9 billion. Uh, and if you looked at the 10 provinces all across the board, the absorption of that grant for devolution was of the order of 24% by the third quarter uh, last year. Now, we don't know what the outturn is, but my analysis statistically would show that they are skewed, the expenditure and drawdowns were skewed to the main cities of Harare and Bulawayo. We can also see the same trend in terms of expenditure on hospitals um, uh, that took place last year. Now, there are other provinces that hardly drew down whether it is capacity on the part of the provinces or the actual politics around the disbursement, I think that's a major worry. And if we want to be an equal growth sort of economy in line with devolution, I would really be advocating that greater attention go to skilling uh, the provinces in terms of drawdown and then making sure that actual drawdowns do take place within the provinces. I'm also an advocate for value chains. And we discussed, discussed this quite extensively. Um, you know, when we uh, discussed as the Zimbabwe Economic Society, the whole value chain approach. If we have a value chain approach that's effective, it's going to speak to and allow, you know, the local companies in the venture capital company that uh, the minister so eloquently has spoken about in the last two years allow the disbursements to go through to the provinces, for example, and that will push provincial economies and allow some of that cash to circulate within those provinces if our people are going to actually experience good growth. We know that the provinces agriculture will do well. Why not allow further food processing within the provinces in a year such as this? So I'm calling for a quick disbursement of that $1 billion that was earmarked uh, for disbursements in terms of venture capital, be it among the youth, uh, the war vets, uh, the women entrepreneurs, but just do something that is focused on the value chains. In light of that, I think we've got to be very, very careful and, and identify our winners from a macroeconomic perspective. And I know for sure the, the winners are the medical supply and services subsector, uh, food processing, agriculture, you know, personal health care, ICT, e-commerce. These are the winners. These are the champions and potential winners in a year such as 2021, where we don't expect too much uh, FDI. Let's, you know, let's just kind of, you know, put pay to that thought it's going to come in droves. People are not traveling yet. And in order to travel, people want you know, feet on the ground. And so what we're going to see is more the infrastructure type of investments along the lines of maybe roads, maybe uh, you know, uh, power, et cetera. But let's pick our winners. Let's support our winners. Uh, the definite losers, whether we lie or not, you know, tourism isn't gonna do too great. And there's an increased focus always on wanting to subsidize and build airports. I mean, for crying out loud, why are we building airports? Who's gonna to come to them now? Just slow that down a bit and divert resources into other areas that are winners. Things like education, financial services are potential winners for Zimbabwe because we've done well locally. We've done well internationally. Health services, let's, you know, let's get into telemedicine, for example. Let's use our brains in an effective way so that we can grow our economy. But the, the, the old model of thinking that, you know, life is normal, it isn't. And COVID has, you know, kind of made sure that it isn't. We must pick our winners. We must, you know, stop thinking that uh, we will get too much help. The big help that actually came through from our development partners, and I know this for a fact, uh, came through on the part of health services and the support that they offered 
uh, you know, the health sector. Now, even where we are getting donations, where we are getting grants, uh, you know, for education, health, uh, you know, let's utilize those in a clever way so that we are buying perhaps you know, I'm an advocate of maybe secondhand health equipment in order to just make sure that our people are able to be equipped, you know, within the hospitals. I mean, to have an allocation of say 5.5 million US dollars equivalent for the health subsector in a year like this, when COVID is really rife, I think would be sad. So I would be appealing to the minister to retweak. Uh, we didn't expect that. Uh, water infrastructure is a big play. Our dams are, 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 are overflowing. Let's make sure those dam walls, you know, are up and running. Let's make sure our irrigation uh, infrastructure is in place so that not only 2020, uh, 2021 is a good year, but let's take on some insurance factor for the year uh, 2022 as well. So I think in a nutshell, I, I do maintain some optimism, uh, albeit modest. I would still stick to probably a two to three percent growth uh, in GDP. I would be aggressive in terms of dispersing some investment funds, uh, allocate them provincially, uh, you know, to winners so that uh, we have economies that are running. So I think, um, let me pause there and then be able to handle questions. I didn't speak to FDI. Uh, FDI within itself, we saw the peak of investment allocate, uh, applications only at $2.2 billion. That peaked in 2019. Uh, the 2020 figures aren't out yet, but I really don't expect that the applications themselves would have been very much above $1.5 billion. And then the actual investments in terms of FDI, we're seeing more of equipment come through rather than actual money being dispersed. So let's be able to account for that. And, you know, on that front, about $500 million would have been expected in 2020. To think we can still peak and get 12 billion, I think not yet. We'd have to wait until globally this COVID agenda or, you know, COVID pandemic rather, is, is over. So let me stop there. Uh, thanks, Noor, for giving me the opportunity uh, and I will listen in. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nigel Chanakira, for your uh, presentation. I picked up quite a few things from there, but uh, one of the most important ones that, um, you know, two, actually, the capacity of our hospitals um, on um, the soft skills, as, as you mentioned, that the hardware is there, um, but we do hope that our government will be able to redirect some of the resources in the budget towards ensuring that our hospitals are, have got um, staff in them. Uh, we know that there are a couple of uh, business sector initiatives that have um, come up. Um, I'm, I'm part of one of those initiatives, which is Business Fighting COVID. We also have sought them and um, quite a number of others um, in Bulawayo, there's I am for Bulawayo. And all of these are initiatives um, that are trying to assist and to strengthen the country's um, response um, to the pandemic. And as you are saying, um, Dr. Chanakira, we also need assistance uh, with our learning um, system um, so that our schools can adopt fully um, online learning and our learners are not prejudiced uh, because of not being able to go to school uh, physically during this period. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be taking questions um, at the end of the presentations of all our panelists. And I'm very happy to say that uh, both our panelists, um, Honorable BT as well as um, Honorable Eddie Cross have been able to join our Zoom platform. Um, so we will go straight away to um, Honorable BT, um, who is um, now ready to go through with his presentation if you may um, unmute um, him technical team and he may go ahead with his presentation, then we will have um, Eddie Cross after, uh, after him. Um, thank you. Hello, C can you hear me? Yes, you may proceed, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, well, look, uh, 
I think that uh, the prospects for 2021, in my respectful opinion, uh, will actually be worse than 2020. Uh, and I think it's because um, the regime is failing to address the fundamental structural issues uh, that need to be addressed. And I'll deal with uh, the same, not necessarily in any order of importance. Uh, to me, an economy is 60% confidence. An economy is, is a social contract, a, an agreement between those that are governed and those that are uh, uh, you know, governing. So the issues around trust are important. Issues around legitimacy are important. Uh, issues around cohesiveness are important. Issues around a common unifying vision are important. I don't see a common vision uh, in Zimbabwe. I see the dominance of uh, mistrust uh, I see the destruction uh, of unifying uh, values within uh, the common uh, state. The existence, for instance, of violence in our streets, particularly violence perpetrated uh, against those with alternative uh, opinion, has an economic uh, impact. The arrest of people like uh, Fadzai Mahere, people like uh, Opel Chingono, Job Scala, uh, has an economic uh, impact. It, uh, it subtracts, it corrodes, it devalues uh, the social fabric uh, of that uh, nation state. So regrettably, because of the overwhelming choking effect of politics in our body psyche, in our economy, I don't see, uh, you know, I don't see a better, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, 2021. 20, uh, 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 secondly, the impact of COVID. Uh, COVID is real and COVID is going to be with us for a long time. Regrettably, COVID costs the economy. COVID puts a premium uh, on, the, on the economy. The battle right now is a battle between the spread of infections, the spread of new variants of COVID-19 and the battle to secure uh, vaccines. So if you look at the rest of the world, if you look at Europe, if you look at uh, the United States of America, that race is on, the race between vaccination and the race to stop the spread of new infections, and more importantly, more recently, to stop the spread and emergence of new variants of the disease. Now, juxtapose that to Zimbabwe. We don't have a policy on vaccines. The 2021 budget did not even make a provision of a single cent on vaccines. What actually worries me is the cynicism of the regime of the government on, on, on vaccines. You have uh, ministers uh, that don't know what they're talking about, actually questioning the validity of vaccines as if we have, a, 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 as if we have a, a, any other credible uh, alternative. Up until now, the government doesn't have a policy on, on, on vaccines. I was reading the daily news uh, today, which with great respect has become the same as the air out. There's, there's skepticism uh, reflected in the headline uh, on, on, on vaccines uh, in that particular uh, uh, newspaper. Vaccines critical, but not sufficient. I mean, this is just ridiculous. This is just ridiculous, the questioning of uh, uh, vaccines. So without vaccines, without testing a people, without provision of social safety nets to those that are locked up, without the provision of a fiscal package to businesses, particularly small businesses that are hit hard by COVID, the economy is going to sink. I run a law firm, which is not a big uh, uh, law firm. I think I'll be able to pay my workers for the next three, four months, but I don't know how long this uh, COVID uh, will last. I may have to close uh, my shop, but I know that I'm better off than many other uh, lawyers. I know that I'm better off than many other small uh, uh, to medium uh, uh, businesses. So in short, the government and the regime is not putting sufficient measures to vaccinate and protect the people of Zimbabwe 
against uh, the impact of a hardcore uh, uh, lockdown. Uh, secondly, the government does not have a plan of prevention, and prevention is a, a, you know, a vaccine. Thirdly, the government has failed to put in social safety nets uh, for the poor. And once you don't put safety nets for the poor, you will find the vendors of tomatoes and vegetables back uh, in the streets of Harare, Bulawayo, as we are in fact uh, witnessing. I'm a mem member of parliament for Mabvuku, uh, Tafara, Harare East. The, the, the COVID is a middle class thing. Masks are a middle class thing. If you go to Chemanza, Chenam, or if you go to, uh, to, 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 to Tafara, people are not putting masks because a mask is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a luxury. So I regret to say that uh, the impact of COVID on this economy is going to be huge and it is going to be uh, debilitating. Third is the mismanagement of the foreign currency and exchange rate regime. Uh, in my respect for submission, and I've maintained this uh, consistently, uh, de-dollarization was a disaster. SI-33 of 2019 was a disaster. SI-142 of 2019 was an, was an absolute uh, disaster. The Finance Act number two of 2019, uh, uh, adopted by Parliament on the 2nd of August 2019, was a disaster. We tried to de-dollarize when conditions for de-dollarization simply did not exist. We did not have sufficient uh, reserves. Uh, we did not have sufficient uh, exports. We do not have a healthy a, 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 a current account, but most importantly, we do not have public confidence and trust in our own uh, domestic uh, uh, currency. The truth of the matter is that there is no country in the world, uh, possibly with the exception of Panama in 1904, that is voluntarily, so that is involuntarily uh, dollarized, that has been able to de-dollarize. What you can do with some measure of success, and some few countries have done it, is to introduce your own currency when conditions are right, but you allow the exchange rate to be open and to be free, or alternatively, you peg that currency, that your local currency, to the US dollar, so that your currency just become, for all intents and purposes, just change to facilitate small transactions uh, in the economy. But full-blown full uh, de-dollarization, such as what the regime tried to do uh, in uh, uh, February of 2019, and subsequently uh, June of 2019, and subsequently August of 2019, uh, is not uh, possible. Uh, it's not possible. Uh, it's not possible. So the economy is now carrying the burden uh, of this uh, major uh, policy uh, mis misstep. We now have essentially four economies that are existing in this country. A, 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 a de-dollarization has failed. So you now have a dominant economy. The dominant economy in this economy at the present moment is the US dollar cash economy. Everyone, including you, my sister, Nobel, you have some US dollars uh, somewhere uh, uh, on you. I wonder where, but you do have some US mm -hmm. dollar. My brother, Nigel, you've got US dollars in your pocket. But sadly for you and me, we did not acquire that US dollars from official sources. Our banks are not issuing us uh, with US dollars. We, we can't, we're too small to apply for money on the Dutch uh, auction uh, system. Therefore, we acquired this foreign currency on the alternative market, also known as the, uh, or the parallel uh, market, also known as the uh, black market uh, uh, foreign uh, exchange. And we know that there are huge billions of foreign exchange that are trading on that market. We simply need to look at gray imports. We simply need to look at the huge amounts of goods that we are importing uh, from uh, South Africa through the Malaitas of uh, this world, televisions, uh, blankets. The only thing which we are not importing through gray imports are, are motor vehicles, but anything else, including formal businesses, formal businesses are actually using Malaitas to bring uh, goods uh, into Zimbabwe. So there's a dominant economy out there, which is the US dollar uh, cash economy. Yet the formal economy is indexed in the local 
US, sorry, Zim dollar uh, currency. The budget itself is indexed in the local uh, Zim dollar currencies. Wages, public sector wages are indexed in the local Zim dollar currencies. Uh, 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 pensions are indexed in the local Zim dollar currencies. Now there's a distortion, and I want to mention two factors. The first one is the dishonesty of our data. The data becomes dishonest. Any data that is expressed in a currency other than the dominant currency becomes, it becomes dishonest, it becomes dishonest. So, so our data and, and statistics is dishonest, whether we are talking about, uh, about inflation figures, whether we are talking about uh, our aggregates uh, for, for, for GDP, whether we are talking about uh, our social indi 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 indices, anything now being measured in a currency that is not one that is dominantly in use is, 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 is dishonest. And that affects the quality of critical thinking, that affects the quality of analysis in Zimbabwe because there's a disconnect. We are measuring an economy that is in Mars when we're in Venus. We're in Venus in an economy that is dominated by the US dollar a cash uh, 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 you know, you know, you know, you know, in economy. The second factor is the disparity, the disparity between the official exchange rate and the open market exchange rate. There's a difference of at least 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent premium between the official exchange rate and the open market exchange rate. The official exchange the, is around 82, and it's been around 82 from June 20. A, a 20 when the Dutch exchange a, a system was uh, introduced, but the black market rate is anything between 130, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 140. Now, that is a disaster for the working people of Zimbabwe. Many of us, you acquire your US dollars, you go to a shop like Pick and Pay, and your currency is discounted at US uh, 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 $82, but you acquired that currency at 130. Uh, but more importantly, the prices in that shop are already a value then index at the parallel market rate, because that is the only way that the shop owner will reproduce himself. He has to put and peg his prices on the official parallel rates. But when he charges you now, because he's afraid of the government, he will charge you at the Dutch auction system. Those few that are, are, are brave enough to use the parallel rates, they don't give you receipts. And what is the effect of a non-receipted economy? There's no revenue that goes to the to the fiscals. So the regime is, is, is maintaining a lie. It is maintaining a fiction. And, but it, uh, regrettably, that fiction is costing it in terms of actual revenue that ought to be a, a, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, coming to it. But more importantly, the fiction is devaluing the economy. The fiction is devaluing the economy. The fiction is making our GDP shrink. So in real terms, the GDP of this country is around 11 billion. Uh, US dollars. And if you look at what indices, they are consistent with a GDP that is less than 14 billion US dollars because the devaluation of, of the exchange rates, the artificial exchange rates, is the consequences of also shrinking a real GDP. And Zimbabwe is paying a price. Mutuli Mube, even though he's a professor of economics, I don't think he understands the multiplier effect of the mismanagement uh, of the of the of the of the exchange rate. Now, what worries me about the exchange rate mobile is that it's a rigged exchange rate. It is a rigged exchange rate. They don't like me to. They don't want to hear me uh, say this. If you look at the rate from June to now, it has averaged and flattened at one is eighty two. But Zimbabwe is a very weak economy. I presented a state of the economy address on behalf of the MDC in December last year. And one of the things that I did creatively was to compare the movement of the US dollar to the rand, the US dollar to the euro, the US dollar to the rupee, the US dollar to the British pound. And those graphs, those graphs were implosive. They were a series of ups and downs, ups and downs. They reflected volatility. Yet these are stronger currencies than Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean graph was flat, yet it's a small, struggling, captured economy. What does that mean? John Panoneta Mangungla and his colleagues at Crosswiz here are rigging the Dutch auction system.
and the market reflects, the markets react. This is why the, the parallel market rate is shooting because nobody believes John Panonese Mangungla, nobody believes Eddie Cross, nobody believes a, a, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. It goes back to what I said at the beginning, that the real price on the economy, the real premium, premium on this economy is lack of trust. We don't trust Mutuli Ngube, we don't trust Ed Cross, we don't trust uh, John Panonetsa uh, Mangungla, even though he's a good friend uh, of, 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 of mine. But, but, but the devastating effect in mobile is on wages. The devastating effect is on pensions. Nigel and I will be able to tell you that billions of dollars were lost first time around of pension. The Justice Smith Commission of Inquiry into Pension Funds confirmed that US $5.68 billion were lost during the first tsunami, the meltdown years of 2006 to 2008. Now, in under 10 years, we have gone through another tsunami of lost pension. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm acting for a man called Rasmus Paspanuja, a retired worker from Zimplas. From 2009 to 20. Uh, when he was retired, he was paying, because he works for Zimplatz, he was paying his pension to the old mutual in US dollars. When they retired him, because he had developed a liver disease, a lung disease called nymconosis, the old mutual in April of 2020 paid him 22,000 Zimbabwean dollars when he was supposed to be paid 22,000 US dollars. I, he has come to me and we are suing the old mutual to say, Pay me 22,000 US dollars, not 22,000 board notes. The old mutual is, is hiding behind such an instrument 33 of 2019. They are affecting this poor pensioner, notwithstanding the fact that they make a gross income of more than US uh, uh, $5 billion annually, and much of that comes from Zimbabwe. There are thousands of thousands of people in Rasmus Paspanujas situation. But I want to come to wages. The net effect of devaluing people's wages is that our public wage system has collapsed. Our public health delivery system has collapsed. Our public education system has collapsed. Now, with, with the health, health is short term, people are going to die. And the cynicism in this country, we, we are not afraid of, 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 of death, uh, which, which is worrying. But for me, the real disaster is what we are doing to the education system. I come from a, an extremely a poor background. I speak very good English uh, with a terrible accent, uh, mobile, because I was educated by a functional public education system. I went to the Eton of my time, a Goromonzi High School. I was a bright uh, uh, you know, student. But now the country can't reproduce People like me and Nigel Chanakira and others of our generation who went to sound a public, a, you know, you know, you know, education. So we are now creating generations that are illiterate, generations with a devalued a value system, generations who think that Wikne Ochivayo or Ojinimbi or what's his name, the others are, are, are heroes because they can make money without the industry of education. That's not possible. So we're creating a nation uh, of, 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 of failures. So we need to deal with the issue of currency reform as a matter of agency, as a way of dealing immediately, immediately uh, with the challenge uh, of uh, public sector, uh, public uh, sector uh, collapse. So these are the things the nation will pay a short term price, but with education will pay a long term price. A, a price. Education is a license. Education is a key that unlocks a, a value a, that unlocks a, a, a nationhood. So I'm really, a, really a worried about that. The third thing, which I think will bring this economy down, and I didn't hear Nigel uh, speaking about it. I hope he spoke about it before I came. Is corruption. With great respect to the Democratic Republic of Congo to Nigeria, to Kenya, to South Africa. We have easily become the most corrupt country in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is confirmed by the Gini coefficient 
that measures the inequality. This is also confirmed by figures that are coming from uh, the Transparency International. As chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, I'm very disturbed that by now, 2021, we still don't have the audited statements of, of 2019. They're not out. If you speak, the official line you get from the authorities is that we were delayed by COVID. But I'll tell you the real answer, uh, Nobi, the real answer is that there was so much corruption in 2019. There was so much corruption in 2019. They stole money from Treasury and bought a mine called Zim Alwis. We don't know where they got the money to buy, uh, to buy BNC. They took $500 million and took it to Dubai to buy gold from the, from the, from the, from the DRC. They continued issuing treasury bills like confetti, as you and I uh, uh, know. There's a company called Secunda, which is now into everything, everything you can think of, whether it's hospitals, whether it's COVID acquisitions, whether it's mines and command agriculture. So in my respect for of it, Honorable VT, if you may start wrapping up, please, um, so that we can hear Eddie Cross's presentation, then we go into question and answer. Very okay, valid point you're raising, I'll, but please may start wrapping up. Yes, I'll, I'll wind up. Yeah, so thank you. The corrupt, yeah, corruption, particularly in the commodity sectors, our minerals are doing very well. Our minerals are doing very well, but regrettably, much of that is being stolen. Much of that is not being accounted. Uh, to the fiscals. When I was used Minister of Finance, I used to complain about opaqueness with regards to diamonds. Over 15 billion US dollars was stolen in this country. But now in 2021, it's not just diamonds, it's gold. It's not just gold, it's chrome. It's not just a chrome, it's also platinum. So corruption is going to put a huge dent uh, in our in our in our in our in our country. And one of the things that we need to deal with are the quasi-fiscal activities of the central bank. Uh, Nigel spoke about uh, what he calls uh, the fiscal discipline of the new minister of finance. I beg to differ. Uh, you know, I beg to differ. Uh, firstly, if you look at the increase in broad money, M3, it has been increasing. It has been increasing. And part of that increase are the quasi-fiscal activities uh, of the of the central bank. So what is in fact happening is that the budget deficit in real terms is now being hidden at the at the central bank where shenanigans uh, are taking place uh, there. I'm particularly concerned, Nobile, by the Reserve Bank's continued use of the export surrender requirement, which is which is unlawful, which is unconstitutional, because only the consolidated revenue fund or parliament should be able to to receive money. So you see. Uh, uh, illegalities there. You see illegalities in the Reserve Bank borrowing without parliamentary approval from institutions such as the African Import and Export Bank, which is against the laws of the country. You see the Reserve Bank securitizing their debt with the African Export Export Bank with the gold in this country. Our law does not provide for securitization in this country. So one of the things that will put a premium in this country is a rogue central bank led by my friend, uh, Panoneta uh, John uh, Mangundla. So in short, I want to advocate the following things. Number one, there has to be political reform. There has to be convergence. There has to be dialogue. Without dealing with the political factor, nobile, we are wasting time. Let's address the uh, politics. Number two, I would like to see major currency reform. Let's, let's see, go back to the regime of multiple currency, Yes, we can retain our Zim dollar, but allow an open market exchange rate, not a rigged uh, you know, you know, exchange rate. Three, let's have the plan for COVID. Let's have the plan for acquisition of vaccines. We don't have the plan for, for acquisition of vaccines. Let's have a rollout a, a, a plan. Let's go to the World Bank and ask for money. Let's go to the, to the UN and ask for money uh, for vaccines. Let's use our budget to finance a, a, you know, vaccines. Let's have a proper a fiscal a, a package for companies that are suffering, for individuals that are suffering because of the imposition of the hardcore uh, COVID. And number four, let's deal with corruption. Number five, let's deal with investment in our public uh, a social delivery system, particularly education, particularly health, 
particularly living people living with a with a with a with a with a, 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 a disability. I heard Nigel talk about devolution. I support devolution, but the challenge with displacement that are being done right now in Koma Nigel is that the devolution law that is envisaged in chapter 14 of our constitution, read together with section 278, has not been enacted. So if you are going to make disbursements when the enabling legislation is there, it's as good as throwing money uh, down the drain. And you and I know that these men, so before we disperse, let's have the enabling legislation, the devolution law. I went to court representing some people, I think in Fundomuli, Rast Makam, and the, and the government consented to an order that we have a devolution law by March of 2021. But yet, disbursements are being made. How can you make disbursements without the legal framework, particularly the legal framework of accountability? Next, let's deal with corruption, real corruption. Let's deal with the real thieves, not the small chips uh, that we are arresting, catching and releasing, catching and releasing. Uh, uh, the next, let's deal with our sovereign debt. We have no funds, and there will never be foreign direct investment to deal with our infrastructure. Look at the state of our roads. With great respect to the Democratic Republic of Congo, we've become the portal of sub the portal capital of sub-Saharan Africa. But we don't have the budget that will ever be able to finance gross capital formation in this country. So let's resolve the debt question and make peace with the IMF. The IMF released billions of dollars last year for COVID. We didn't get a single cent because we're a pariah state. We are ugly. We stink. Let's restore our relations with the International Monetary Fund, uh, with, the, with, the, with the World Bank, uh, with the African Development Bank, so that we can access the huge amounts of development finance that are in these institutions. After all, the original name of the World Bank was the International Bank of Reconstruction. It's a post-World War a banking institute. We are not accessing uh, those monies because of our politics. We are beating up people. We are stealing elections. We are, we are raping women. We are selectively applying the, 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 the rule of law. That is toxic. It won't get us, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, anyway. When we deal with our sovereign debt, we're able to deal with the last issue, the issue of gross capital formation. As I keep on saying, if you wake up in Bianianda, she won't get lost in Harari because there's been no effectively gross capital formation. So we need gross capital formation, new dams, new roads, a, 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 you know, you know, spider road networks, a, a, a spaghetti a, a roads, speed trains, and so forth. I'll stop here, not be there because I make a living from speaking. I'll stop here. Um, thank you, thank you very much, um, Honorable Miti. Yes, uh, you and I both make a living from speaking, as we are learned colleagues. Um, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Some very hard hitting facts. I won't try and summarize um, anything that you've said. Uh, we have quite an engaged um, audience and many questions are coming up on our Facebook, also on the various Twitter platforms. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, up next, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have Honorable Eddie Cross, uh, who is uh, back on the platform. Thank you so much. Uh, you may go ahead with your presentation. Then, of course, when he has completed, we will go off into the question and answer um, session. Um, over to you, um, Eddie Cross. Thank you. I do apologize that my system dropped me off the off the network and I couldn't get back in. Um, <clears throat> mm, after hearing that uh, sermon from Tendai Beatty, um, I'm afraid I'm going to be much shorter and uh, and and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not going to to try and answer any of the things that he raised or anybody else did. I just simply to state my perception of what likely to happen in 2021. I don't agree with my colleagues. I think the prospects for 2021 are in fact quite good. I think agriculture is going to be turning a good result. I think mining is going to be good. I think there's going to be growth in both sectors. I'm quite surprised by the performance of the tourism sector. There's been a lot of domestic tourism. And I've been quite surprised by the by the occupation rates, particularly of the lower end uh, facilities uh, at the Victoria Falls, for example, the big the big hotels, the eight hundred dollars a night hotels are empty, but the lodges at fifty dollars, hundred dollars a night, 
are in fact quite full. And um, so what do I think overall? I think overall, we're going to see relative stability in 2021. I see the exchange rate depreciating to some extent. I think that the, the rate at the moment, the open market rate is probably about 100 to 110. And um, <clears throat> the auction rate at 80, 81, 82 is, uh, is, is holding steady. Uh, but the real problem is securing enough hard currency to put on the auction to meet demand. And uh, the indications are at this stage that we may well have to start cutting off the lower end of bids. And so I expect the auction rate to depreciate to some extent in the near future. But, but overall, I think the big advantage of the auction is that it has brought stability and uh, no industrialist would deny that. And I think that this stability is not artificial. I think it's real. And I think you look at the, 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 the black market rate, when we floated the auction in Ju June 2020, uh, the black market rate was headed for 200 to one. Um, many of my <clears throat> friends and colleagues in the private sector uh, forecast that we would be at 200 to one by Christmas. That was not the case. I'm quite concerned that inflation remains at about 4% a month, because I think that's too high. Um, I think Mtuli's estimate for the year is probably going to be about right uh, because of this relatively of, of monthly inflation. And I put the monthly inflation figure down to growth in money supply very largely. Um, we've, we've shown at the, at the Reserve Bank, our research, the direct correlation between money supply and the exchange rate. And I think that uh, and until we stop printing money for various purposes, um, and the main buying gold. Uh, we print about a billion dollars a week. On the question of dollarization, and we are in effect in a multi-currency environment, we're going to be in a multi-currency environment. I want anybody to try and argue that, um, that the US dollar is the dominant currency. It's not. Um, our total transactions per day are run, running a billion dollars. And the majority, 90% of that is in RTGS. And uh, US dollars are important. We, the one big problem we have at the moment, we have local currency for transactions. And therefore people have to use the US dollar for local transactions. And we're surprised by the, by the extent of which we have local uh, foreign currency. But I, I would expect uh, that we'll have, we could have lo uh, inflation lower than the budget predicts. And I suspect that the growth rate could in fact be higher 2021. And I think if we start continuing, if we continue to, to exercise fiscal and monetary discipline, um, I think that those conditions will prevail in very much indeed. Um, thank you very much, um, Honorable Cross, for your presentation, uh, which was, um, as you had promised, uh, given um, the presentations that we've had um, so far. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going into our question and answer session. Uh, we have received quite a few questions on our Facebook page, of course, on our Zoom platform. Um, but please, uh, may you continue to share with us your questions uh, that you'd like to direct to our various um, guest uh, panelists who we have. Um, the, the first question um, that I will direct uh, likely to either Honorable BT and maybe um, uh, Mr. Eddie Cross has to do with uh, the currency auction. Uh, Honorable BT, as you did mention um, that um, the, your sentiments regarding uh, the exchange rate and also the supply of the foreign currency and you stated quite uh, very strongly that the, however, there are some questions coming up from our Facebook that why is it taking long for that settlement um, to happen? Uh, we have some settlements going on for as long as either one of you, either Honorable BT or Honorable um, Eddie Cross uh, may take that question. Uh, for those who are joining us on the Zoom platform, please feel free to put your questions on the chat them to the appropriate speaker. At um, maybe at a later stage, we will open up to the people who are joining us on Zoom to proceed uh, with uh, questions 
Um, but for now, uh, we have that question that has come from the Honorable Miti or Eddie Cross may answer. Thank you. Yeah, we have a problem with this mute and unmute system. Um, we can't unmute uh, when requested, and the delays are, are quite significant. Right? When we started the auction in in June, we were we were handling about fifteen million dollars a week. We're now at about thirty five million dollars a week, and uh, we, <clears throat> as it grew a foreign exchange across the market, which we did first by imposing liquidation of domestic of domestic FCA nostros at twenty percent and uh, in the liquidation of export proceeds uh, to 40% from 30%. Um, but in addition, we've been putting pressure on the treasury, their proceeds from tax revenues paid in US dollars. Uh, they're receiving a very substantial sum of US every, every week. Um, and we've been arguing that some of this should be liquidated on the productive sector instead of being used for government purposes. I think one of the things we need to recognize on this forum is that all the critical import requirements now, fuel, soya beans, um, cooking oil, bulk oil, uh, are all now being imported by the private sector. And the, the, the auction is providing the foreign exchange for these. That's been uh, completely different, different to, to what was happening pre previously. And uh, I must say, this was a decision taken by a subcommittee of cabinet and it has proved to be really an, an effective and, and important decision. Clear the arrears, um, which had accumulated up to the end of the year, which amounted to about $70 million, about two weeks auctions. Um, we were able to clear that by this last week. We had $34.8 million last week for uh, the auction, and we, ad we allocated $35 million. And this week, we've been in more or less the same situation. And I think so long as we are able to meet the demand for foreign exchange on the auction, I think the auction will continue to be the primary determinant of the official exchange rate. <coughs> Um, thank you very much, um, Honourable Cross, uh, for responding to those uh, to that um, question. Uh, we have more questions coming up, and there is one that is directed to Honourable BT, um, which says, Honourable BT, may you please give us at least two positive things that you see as prospects for Zimbabwe um, that we truly have. There's uh, a significant uh, number of posts that are appreciating your uh, contributions as well as the presentation done by um, um, Madame Gloria uh, Jaravanu. Um, they are very appreciative of the candidness of both of those um, presentations and also from the other panelists. So two positive things or prospects uh, from you, Honorable BT for Zimbabwe for 2021. Uh, please unmute him. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have lost um, Honorable Tendai Biti. Uh, when he rejoins, we will proceed uh, with the questions. Um, so we have another question coming up, which says, um, okay, thank you, uh, which is uh, directed uh, to Mr. Kundani. Uh, Mr. Kundani, if you may uh, take us through, um, as you are part of uh, one of the largest uh, business member organizations in the country, which is the, the CO Africa Roundtable Forum. If you may take us through uh, the views of the members of your BMO regarding access uh, to the 18 billion um, stimulus package uh, that was rolled out by the government. We heard, of course, Honorable Biti talking about uh, the need for social 
um, security net, and this is one of them that was rolled out last year. May you please share with us, um, our audience would like to know what the views of your BMO members regarding access uh, to that 18 billion. Please unmute Kipson, thank you. Thank you, thank you, NQ. Uh, well, I think he, you discovered that uh, uh, with almost all businesses suffering from unprecedented financial pressures during uh, this COVID-19 shutdown, short-term forgivable loans are not enough for long-term survival. Uh, the government, yes, offered the 18 billion package uh, through the banks uh, as a financial relief to business, but not many uh, business really uh, accessed that. If there are any that did access that, they are very, very minimal because most banks were reluctant to offer uh, such uh, packages owing to uh, risks that are quite rampant within uh, the financial services uh, industry and the, the, the lending uh, game is it way. So if there were some businesses that really benefited from them, they, they are very minimal. That's one. Then two, the 18 billion Zimbabwean dollar in itself is a very small amount of money. It won't be able to make any tremendous difference uh, given the humongous challenges that are crippling uh, the industry. Then also, if you also look at another critical sector, which is actually a kwashioka of funding, is the uh, uh, farming, farming industry. Yes, the government has been directly uh, dishing out inputs and in financing industry uh, farming, but I think that ought to be done in a more sustainable and bigger way, and also to include a variety of crops uh, so that at least we are able to maximize the, 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 the potential that are associated with it. Uh, and lastly, these sporadic pockets of uh, financing are, are not enough. What is needed is we need a working financial system where you and me as citizens of this country can easily walk into a bank with enough collateral and be able to borrow and be able to pursue our dreams. That is non-existent currently if you look at our financial services industry because of both the historical and the present, present reasons that are affecting the financial services sector. So I think, yes, it was a gesture of 18 billion. Firstly, it was not enough. Secondly, it was difficult to access. So I think more needs to be done in that particular area. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kipson, for that uh, contribution. Uh, maybe we can go to uh, Dr. Nigel Chanakira. Um, there are some questions that are coming up on the platform relating to the uh, foreign currency. Um, and of course, um, Honorable Tendaibiti did mention that um, the de-dollarization um, of our economy was one of the biggest mistakes. Um, so Dr. Nigel Chanakira, as you are a career banker, and on the back of what has been shared by Kipson. Maybe you can share with us your views regarding um, the use of the local currency, the US dollar, and the question here, uh, a lot of the questions that have come up um, regarding uh, why is the US dollar not the dominant currency if prices are pegged in US dollars? So how do we balance that out in our economy, which is um, in, in Zimbabwean dollars, and yet there's this continued um, uh, you know, regression into the US dollar. And Tendaibiti did mention that a country that dollarizes never really fully de dollarized. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks, Mobile. I think the issue, and we must admit, you cannot defy the psyche of markets. Um, I think what uh, Honorable BT speaks to is really what we in economics, rational expectations. What are the expectations that people have? And uh, in a sense, rightly so, you know, it's, it's a function of confidence with regards to your own currency and your own money. 
And so if we look at the conduct of monetary economics for any economy, any basic economy needs its own money because you're never going to export every and import you know, uh, what your requirements are. There is local production. And so to actually then carry the currency of a foreign nation um, in order to you know, institute your domestic trade uh, is not rational. And that's why we have domestic currencies. But uh, then we've got a history, a history of hyperinflation uh, where we destroyed the confidence in the local currency. And that within itself then puts the extent with which you can actually rely on domestic currency for trading purposes, for savings, for investments, and for pensions. And so where we are now, and uh, you know, uh, I know it's not a popular thing, but the, the, the re-engagement process, in my eyes, is an imperative. You, you can't, and, you know, uh, with due respect um, to Professor Mutuli, you know, when he came in, I had a lot of confidence because of his credentials. Uh, he was my supervisor for my dissertation. <laughs> you don't just choose a supervisor unless you actually expect the person academic. So I happen to know Mtuli. I also know Mtuli from his international, uh, you know, accepted, you know, intelligence levels. I mean, you don't just get into Cambridge. You don't work at Oxford. You don't become the chief economist of, of the African Development Bank in a field of, you know, multi-African applicants and end up in that position, then actually gun for the position of running the, 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 the African Development Bank. And so he came with the credentials, he came with the know-how, and he came with the talk. I mean, like him or not, he had the suave and the nuance to be able to communicate in those international circles. What I think is lacking is the political will. And if you don't have the political will in terms of sorting out domestic politics and then your international politics, your economics cannot carry the burden, particularly with the background that we have as a nation. We were hyperinflating, we were running fiscal uh, and, and, and balance of payments deficits. And with that background, you, you know, saying to your otherwise acceptable international, internationally acceptable minister of finance, you know, a race. This is a race for resources globally. This is a race for investments from a global or sub-Saharan African perspective. But then you ask a guy to run with his legs tied and burdened with debt, burdened with domestic politics and burdened with international politics. And so I think without resolution of those key imperatives, I call them imperatives, then we are kind of hung because then the introduction of a domestic currency, you know, can only last so long. This catches up with you. Uh, you know, you, you, your imports have been stifled because of tariff. Your imports are stifled at the moment because your consumption patterns are low, because your real wages are low. And so from that perspective, I'm inclined to agree uh, with the Honorable BT that, you know, engagement is imperative and confidence on the part of domestics. Because as long as there is no domestic dialogue, there is no international dialogue, then truthfully, yes, in my back pocket, I'm going to keep the US dollars. It's rational economic expectations. I don't expect the currency to hold. And um, uh, Eddie uh, Cross just mentioned the fact that um, you know the rate ought to be moving. That was how I read his statement. Now, if it's going to move from 82 and it's going to go to the region of 110, as he suggests, then you know what's the rational economic behavior? I must consume as much as I can now in terms of import requirements 
end those Zim dollars as quickly as I possibly can. Otherwise, I'm done for. I cannot save them. I cannot invest them. Neither can I expect a decent out of them. So already, that puts pressure on the exchange rate in itself. And then, of course, there are your debt issues, which you need. We're carrying, as at the budget state, $8.3 billion worth of debt. In the normal you know, course of things, sell those assets if you could. Some of those telecoms companies, what are we doing with net one? Sell it. What are we doing? Look at what South Africa did. Telecom was sold for billions. Sell, you know, tell one, for example, to people who have resources so that you can show up your economy and allow all other factors to happen so that we may ultimately get confidence in our own currency. But as long as those factors are not on the horizon, they are there. You look at the TSP, I reread it ahead of this. All promises signed for, very little done. And I, you know, I, I speak just as a practitioner. I like to be practical. Let's set up the, you know, the dashboard. The dashboard in terms of international re-engagement would have a very low score in as much as you may have had some degree of fiscal and some degree of monetary discipline. But that fiscal and monetary discipline, uh, Honorable BT says, begins to collapse because uh, you, know, you can't hold, you can't stem the flow in terms of demands that are taking place. So I think in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that we need greater political will if these economic policies are going to bear fruit. But up until now, uh, yeah, we can hope. And I, I hear Eddie very well. He is very hopeful, uh, you know, but it's not sustainable. Uh, it's a, it's a short-term exercise within itself because, you know, Gloria mentioned, how do I read your accounts if I invest? So maybe I'm coming through and I'm investing through that Victoria Falls Stock Exchange. I'm investing only through the export processing zone or special economic zone. But then what happens to the greater populace? And we, saw, we know that these, these economics don't work. They've never worked even in a country like South Africa. The reason South Africa only grows at best at 3% is there is no trickle down impact on the rest of the economy. Why? Because you build these economies without taking into account the populace. And then of course your indices don't reflect the economics that we desire. So I think re is back to the drawing board from a politics point of view. And this calls for both parties. Uh, with due respect, Swabiti, it's engagement on your guys' part. It's engagement part of the other side as well. It takes two to tango. But we as you know, practitioners, as business people, as economists, uh, this equation, we say it can't. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nigel, for the... Um... For your response, which was um, quite um, quite uh, loaded there, and also just you know putting a challenge onto Honourable BT towards the end there to say the engagement is not just a one way, but um, quite a, a two way engagement.
and, and respond to those questions to say, how do we deal with the issues of inconsistency in um, our currency issues? And what do we, um, what would you recommend um, as um, for our 2021 as the prospect? You know, a lot of people have more confidence in the foreign currency and um, Honorable Tendai BT, he kept saying, Mobile, I know you have foreign currency in your pocket. I don't have foreign currency in my pocket. Um, but um, from your um, you know, view as um, part of the accounting profession, how do we deal with this um, discord and this um, on, on local currency use, prices being pegged in uh, foreign currency? You may go ahead, Madam, with your contribution. Uh, thank you, uh, Nobile, for that question. Uh, so first of all, as a country, we've got regulations that we go uh, with as far as reporting is concerned. So the Public Accountants and Auditors Board is the, is the standard setting body for this country. And in 2019 through SI41, they actually issued regulations that says that as a country, we actually subscribe and should report in accordance with international financial reporting standards. That's for both public sector and the general international financial reporting standards. Now, that's the first guideline that we have. So as far as how we report, we report by those standards. And um, the, the, the discussion around functional currency changes, again, it's fully taken care of in the international reporting standard itself. There's procedures as to where, how one can assess what their functional currency is as a business. So if you are using mostly or trading mostly in United States dollars, then likely it's likely that your functional currency is gonna be United States dollars and you would report in that particular currency in line with the international standards. If you're mostly trading uh, in Zim dollars, then likewise your functional currency will also be Zim dollars. Um, I did allude in my presentation earlier that the PAB actually did issue a communication in January where it was actually asking entities to make sure that they go through that process in line with the international financial reporting standards to check whether their functional currency has changed in line with which currency they use. So there are guidelines all the way. That is the beauty of the accounting profession is that we are guide, governed by guidelines and regulations. And we always look at a specific standard. And, and in this case, it's international standard, uh, as Nigel was uh, raising, so that we can be comparable globally. We need to be able to comply to an international standard that allows an investor from anywhere in the world, if they pick up a set of financials uh, from Zimbabwe, they must be able to follow and relate because they are all um, you know, um, uh, relating to the same international standard. Uh, thank you, Mobile. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for that um, response. And I think uh, we all eventually look forward to a time when we go back to, um, you know, where the standards are, are used um, uniformly right across and we don't have um, to keep going um, into the various um, issues to, in order to align that um, discord in the reporting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Honorable BT and Honorable Eddie Cross, um, are not uh, with us on the Zoom platform. I think they face some challenges with their connectivity. However, we will continue uh, with our debate. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions that are coming through on Facebook, um, on Twitter, and also, of course, here on our Zoom platform. Uh, we move on, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, this one maybe keeps on, you can assist in uh, responding to. Uh, there have been questions, and of course, we've heard reports coming from the Reserve Bank that they will issue. Uh, new notes, and um, there are some concerns that if they are new notes that are issued, there will be an increase in money supply. And then, of course, there's um, what um, the impact, uh, the question that's coming through is what is the impact of this? Uh, this had been directed to Eddie Cross, but I'm sure as a BMO uh, leader, you are able to maybe respond to this. Then another question that you may tackle maybe is uh, regarding the informal sector that we have quite a, a large portion of our economy, which is in the informal sector. And with the lockdown continuing, we are not sure how long it's going to continue. What is the impact um, of that lockdown on the informal sector and ultimately on our economy, um, since we have quite um, a, a huge section of our economy, which is informal, 
Then another question that you might want to tackle, which came through, is youth engagement. Of course, uh, we know that the government, and uh, Dr. Chanakira did uh, allude to this in his earlier presentation, has put in place uh, venture capital, and we are looking forward to that uh, being rolled out and ultimately to benefit uh, the young people of our nation. But what other um, areas can the government look to to engaging our youth? So number one, uh, impact of the new notes coming in and increase in money supply. Also impact of the continued lockdown on the informal sector and um, engaging our youth. Um, over to you, Kipson, thank you. Thank you, NQ. Uh, I'll start with the issue of the new higher denominated notes. Um, you know what, if these notes are going to be printed by demonetizing uh, already existing RTGS balances, then there will be no effects on overall uh, money supply in the economy. However, we have got a US dollar circulating in this economy, which is as good as a commodity. So what happens is the new higher denominated notes are likely to put fuel on the parallel market, uh, on the parallel exchange or on the parallel market or on the black market in the sense that the black market was kind of contained to some extent by controlling electronic transactions, by catering electronic transactions, your eco cash, your RRTGS and so forth. So there was kind of some decent control, but now with these uh, uh, higher denominated nodes, if they are injected in the market, there will be no trace or trail, and that is likely to fuel the black market, and that's likely to lead to a depreciation in the exchange rate. And as you may agree with me, most businesses are indexing their prices to the parallel market rate. So if the parallel market depreciates, it means inflationary pressures will also set in, uh, uh, leading to uh, a, a, an increase in the general price level. I think that is the only issue uh, that is likely to happen. And also the optics, given the confidence levels in this economy, if people start seeing higher denominated notes, it, it has got some stimulus in the mindset of Zimbabweans to think that prices have to go up. So there is an inflationary element that is associated with it via the exchange rate and also via the optics. That is my humble submission on that regard. Then coming to the informal sector, well, it is an accepted fact that the bulk population of our people derive their livelihoods from the informal side of the economy. And given the lockdown, it's no brainer that they are they hard hit it. Uh, they are hard hit uh, by the lockdown. And that is what it that, that that will ultimately affect uh, their livelihoods and living standards and also of their extended families. You find this is a result of uh, an economy uh, that is over-regulated, an economy that does not incentivize formal businesses. Yes, most of our people find refugee uh, in the informal economy. Th that is also rational, and uh, that is the default outcome of an economy that was probably dying for a long period of time, and the people find the refugee in the informal economy. But, but it is not a brainer, it is no brainer that uh, uh, they are hard hit by this lockdown. And it's also one sector which will be very, very difficult to provide the stimulus packages because you don't know where to locate the bulk of these guys. You don't know what kind of business are they into. They've got no trade record. So even if you want to bail them out, uh, there is really no uh, tried and tested mechanisms for us to reach out to them uh, uh, with the exception of few that are located in the common centers that we know like Magaba, Bellevue and so forth. But the generality which operates from their backyards and everything else, they will be very, very difficult to track and be able to, to assist and to provide stimulus packages. If I hear your last question, well, NQ was talking about what else can be done to assist our youth and probably the vulnerable uh, sections of our society. I believe that the biggest incentive that you can give to any citizen of a nation for them to pursue their dreams 
is a stable and predictable macroeconomic environment. The, 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 the balls and nuts sh should be there. For me to be able to make a personal decision based on my ambitions and what I want to achieve and be able to go into a particular institution that should be able to make that possible and do it. I think that is the number one incentive that you can give uh, to any particular citizen of any nation, be it youth, be it adults, be it women, be it a businessman, be it whatever you can think of. That, that is number one. Of course, you might come up with deliberate efforts uh, to try and assist uh, certain sections of society, be it women, a bit the youth, as you may see it. This could be through training, uh, concerted financing at concessional rates and all those things, but that is not sufficient for you to be able to change uh, uh, the status of that particular group of people. So my humble submission is to say, let's look at the global picture. Let's just make the environment predictable. Let's make the environment stable. Unfortunately, we are fighting other external variables like COVID and, and so forth, which make uh, the situation worse. But even dealing with the residual and the historical challenges that we have, so that at least we enjoy a stable environment. For me to be able to make a decision and do what I want on a daily basis is the biggest incentive that you can give to anybody. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Kipson, for the very elaborate um, and well-articulated um, responses uh, that you've given there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the section where we open up to the, those joining us on our Zoom platform. Uh, we have some hands up. Um, and before maybe I take that hand, uh, we have uh, Mr. Mishek Ugaro. Uh, the other questions coming up on our Facebook platform, there are concerns regarding uh, the Zimra e-filing system that it is uh, a nightmare at the moment. And of course, we saw some announcements and press statements coming from Zimra um, about a week or two ago uh, regarding uh, the tax clearance certificates for 2021. So there are some concerns there from some business people that uh, the Zimra e-filing system is not, um, is not uh, user-friendly and it keeps crashing. We also have questions regarding uh, you know, local solutions to the COVID pandemic. Um, Honorable BT did, of course, um, uh, highlight uh, the issue that we need, uh, you know, Africa, I mean, sorry, uh, Zimbabwe who, uh, did not receive any funding from the World Bank last year when it rolled out um, some funding for the, um, you know, as part of the COVID relief funds. So as we wait for the vaccines that may be received um, in due course, is it not possible for our own local pharmaceutical companies and also our health practitioners to come together, put their heads together and assist in coming up with a solution um, to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so we go across to Mishek Ugaro. Uh, Mishek, uh, please may you uh, keep your contribution short and also direct it to a specific uh, panelist. I will proceed to unmute your mic, um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mabile. Um Yes, my my my. They will probably now end up as comments because they were both directed at uh, Honorable BT and uh, Eddie Cross. Uh, the first one was a comment on uh, an aspect he touched on the settlement uh, difficulties that is being experienced in the market after the auctions. Uh, to the extent that by yesterday there were rumors and this morning as well that the Nostra accounts have been suspended. Um, it, it is actually generating that uh, uh, sentiment that the central bank seems to be struggling to settle the auction. So it would have been nice to hear what, what Ed would say there or any other member of the, the audience here or the panel could comment on that. And then to Honorable BT, he mentioned a number of valid points, but one particular one which I wanted to direct at him is uh, the issue of uh, devolution, where he says the enabling uh, law has not been enacted. As a member of parliament, I thought that uh, this talks to that engagement issue, where I, I think as a member of parliament, he's, he's, he's uh, complicit to it um, because they are the ones who are supposed to push through that uh, that law and 
I don't expect it if it is not pushed by the minister private bills are accepted in parliament isn't it so they they should be pushing it so that the devolution funds go through to 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 their intended targets those were my comments thanks um thank you very much um Mishek. and um as you said the two panelists have um are not uh, connected on our platform anymore However, uh, regarding the issue to do with the foreign currency allocations, um, Honorable Eddie Cross did highlight that um, the Monetary Policy Committee had done as much as possible to do the allocations, and they had allocated about 35 million uh, US dollars um, for the auction that took place uh, last week. Um, so on the other questions, I'm sure we will get some comments from our other panelists who are there. Uh, we can move on. There's another question here from um, Godfrey Kanyeze. Godfrey, uh, you may go ahead with your contribution. I will unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you so much, Mobile. Um, the challenge with uh, a discussion uh, in this uh, context where we have got uh, a serious pandemic like COVID is that uh, we may also tend to forget that we had uh, huge legacy issues that uh, undermine the economy. So that in the past growth has always been erratic and we've always relied on uh, rebound effects. Um, the issue of structural reforms, public enterprise, ease of doing business reforms, uh, dealing with corruption, all, all those other uh, dimensions, are also very critical so that we don't lose sight of these because they are very important in sustaining any rebound. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for that comment, um, Godfrey. Yes, you do remind us um, quite honestly that we had um, historical um, um, issues there in our economy that still needed to be dealt with. And um, going into 2021, those still need to be factored in as we are coming up with um, the prospects for the 2021 economic outlook. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I can take, uh, if I may take this opportunity to come back to our panelists, uh, maybe across to you, uh, Dr. Shanakira, if you have some few comments uh, on the comments um, that have been raised um, so far by our viewers and also some of the comments coming from the Facebook platform. Across to you, Dr. Shanakira. Okay, thank you, uh, Mobile. I think uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with um, with uh, the comments. I think uh, Mishe Kukaro speaks of um, you know the need to follow through on maybe pushing a private bill on devolution. In my in my heart and soul. Having interacted with parliamentarians during the 2021 budget process, I get a distinct sense that they would buy. I don't even think Honorable BT would be handicapped in pushing that the devolution statutory instruments or laws become effected. This is for common good. This is for their own good, particularly given that our parliament comprises largely rural uh, uh, um, you know, parliamentarians. And so this is a common feature, uh, both urban and, and rural. And I cannot see any MP in his right mind who would vote against accelerating you know, that piece of legislation. In my mind though, it is a bit um, you know, academic to still call for that uh, uh, process because the reality is drawdowns are taking place anyway. The allocations are actually approved by parliament as a lump sum. And then they are spread amongst the different provinces. And so I think it's a moot point to really argue that, you know, the legislative uh, pieces need to go through. But yeah, well, you let him go through with it. But I'm really an advocate of that to push your domestic economy. 
Because if you don't have value addition, if you don't have local industries, if you don't have import substitution in a COVID-19 global world, then you are bound to be stuffed, you know, as an economy. So I think we must be looking more internally. We must promote that devolution process. We must demand. And, you know, again, when, when I raise this point, I raise this point knowing fully well that the competencies are there. I'm not asking in this debate anything that is out of the world. I'm keeping it very practical. Now, Ngobile, I ask the question, Mtuli is an investment banker. 2020, he came up with that venture capital fund. We are in January 2021. Nothing was done about that venture capital fund. Where is it? We want it. We demand it. This year and across provinces, set it up. What's holding him back? That I don't get. And so that will allow more your trickle down uh, effects to take place, your poverty alleviation. It answers to employment. It answers to various things. It answers to provincial hospitals and clinics being done up. Those are all sectors that can win. And so I'm really an advocate that uh, maybe Vabiti champions this cause and uh, we can pin it on him because of course we don't have Mtuli uh, on the line. Then the final comment I'll make is I agree with the, the points that Godfrey makes that uh, Zim as an economy is encumbered by historical structural issues. And those structural issues, I want to emphasize, it starts with domestic engagement, then international engagement. Then in my view, when you've got a flood of, you know, people now looking more seriously at Zimbabwe, your, your, your public sector reform becomes doable. You can then sell part of your inter public enterprises. You can then allow more investment to come so that they are doing their services in a more competitive way. And then we are also focused on infrastructure things, your basic dams, uh, you know, water infrastructure, which is so frayed at the moment. All those I think will act as stimulants in terms of allowing our domestic, um, you know, economy to run again. There's no reason. I mean, we feel public roads, other than the bridges, I would say 70% of your roads, you know, in terms of building and repairing roads, the inputs are domestic in the main. And so it's your equipment in terms of your bulldozers, et cetera, et cetera, that you are then importing. And so the domestic component in getting things going and employment going are all very, very possible. But, um, you know, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chanakira, for the comments. And uh, you continue to, um, you know, provide uh, valid solutions. And of course, because we are streaming live on Facebook, ladies and gentlemen, this video will be available even after this meeting has concluded. And hoping that our various authorities, our government ministers, particularly our Minister of Finance, will be able to um, watch the video and hear the views that are being expressed here today by our captains of industry by our audience that is joining us on Zoom, on Facebook, and they may be able to implement um, the suggestions that have been brought forward. Absolutely correct, um, you know, Dr. Nigel, that we are all looking and uh, waiting for the implementation of the Venture Capital Fund. And also, um, you know, as Kipson had highlighted earlier, that the 18 billion stimulus package was very difficult to access. So again, uh, there is need for the government to revisit um, how those, um, items were implemented and try and maybe as we get into 2021 uh, to improve upon um, that access. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to wrap up our discussion for this morning. Um, but before we do, I will call upon uh, the panelists uh, who are still with us, uh, that is um, Kipson and Madam Gloria to give us um, their closing remarks. I hope that we've been able to um, you know, uh, leave here with some takeaways 
And of course, um, we hope that our ministers will be able to um, implement um, some of the, the issues that have been raised once this is brought to their attention. But we have heard from our panelists regarding their prospects for 2021 for the Zimbabwean economy. Uh, we start off uh, with uh, Madame Gloria, uh, your closing remarks, ma'am, uh, for, the, for, the, for today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been really great to, to share our own perspectives, but also to listen to the perspectives um, shared by the other panelists as well as the participants. Um, I think it just brings to light and really opens up the outlook from all angles, which is absolutely important. Um, I think opportunities were shared, and I think there were pickings, um, you know, that different sectors can focus on um, to try and salvage uh, their businesses, especially given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. What I just wanted to add uh, is that I think we've shared a lot of um, things that needs to be done, uh, but the issue of uh, improved accountability and transparency that was brought at the end by um, uh, Nigel and also uh, Godfrey talking about public sector reforms. I think the issue of accountability and transparency, enhanced accountability and transparency is important because that is the glue that will hold together everything that we are trying to do. So the issues of corruption, uh, the issues of good governance, um, the issues of good reporting, uh, as you know, as Zimbabwe, we are trying to move towards um, reporting under the pub international public sector accounting standards from a cash accounting basis, where we're just reporting what we've received and what we've paid, not reporting anything that is in the tables as far as what we haven't paid and so on. So that was not showing a complete picture. But going towards enhanced transparency and enhanced accountability will also help as far as um, you know, our investment attractiveness, our sincerity as well in doing these things is important. I think as we put certain laws to ensure that we also enhance our corporate governance, I think the implementation and enforcement of all those things is important and, and is the glue that will hold together all the beautiful initiatives that we could put together uh, to get the, the economy going. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Gloria, for those um, closing remarks. Um, over to you, Kipson, if you may share your closing remarks. Thank you, NQ. Uh, my parting shot to be very simple. It will be to say, uh, as a nation, and particularly our policymakers, I think the earlier we stop what I can define as a random walk, uh, the better. We need to clearly define the war architecture on how do we intend to revive this Zim economy from a purely an economic perspective, from a political perspective, and also from a social perspective so that at least we can build what I can term Team Zimbabwe. A random walk has got one serious danger. It might lead us into an unintended destination. Let's imagine what kind of a Zimbabwe do we want to have uh, post the COVID-19 crisis. Are we going to emerge stronger or weaker? I think those are the critical questions which we need to table on the uh, which you need to table and be able to deal with them decisively. Thank you. Um, Kipson, thank you very much uh, for those closing remarks. Um, I know Dr. Nigel, you've just um, made your contributions, but uh, you know, if you have some more closing remarks, please uh, go ahead and share. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I wasn't sure whether I'll get another crack at this, uh, but uh, suffice to say, uh, Zimbabweans, let's stay positive. Let's stay innovative. Let's stay creative. On a practical level, I'm, I've got a garden going, you know, just outside my home. What does that mean? It means my vegetable consumption has improved. I can combat COVID in a more effective way. And I'm pretty sure most of us with the rains as they are, are well capable of that. Let's make sure we're well fed. Let's make sure we have good. Let's make sure we exercise. 
Let's make sure we then think creatively on how we can utilize our skills and get into the mode of winning in this COVID-19 era. Let's be safe, yet let us not cower, but go forward in a positive way. We can run a better nation, that much I know. And I say this to our policymakers, I say this to fellow Zimbabweans. Fellow Zimbabweans, don't just expect anything and everything to be given on a silver platter, you know, by the policymakers. Let's take initiatives that are homegrown. Let's take initiatives within our own communities and make, let's make sure that this vision of living better lives, having more educated children, better community projects such as hospitals are actually put into play. It's called enlightened self-interest. I did that with Solidar Solid my colleagues at Solidarity Trust of Zimbabwe. And we raised within, during the COVID period, 1.5 million US dollars. And we put up a facility um, that uh, we all know to be St. Anne's. And it heartens me to see that Ekusileni will be up and running pretty soon. We haven't stopped. Victoria Falls will be up and running. Thorn Grove, there are 1,800 other hospitals to be done. So let's not just sit on our rusty dusties. Thank you very much and uh, have a prosperous 2021. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chanakira, for um, your remarks. And yes, you are right that uh, we should not wait for things to be handed over to us on a silver platter. Um, also, it's important just to continue to um, look around us and to use the resources available to us uh, for us to make life a bit better in our own country and also have that spirit of volunteerism, even if things are difficult, because no matter how hard life is for you, there's somebody else who's in a worse off position than you are. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of our program today. Uh, we have online Mr. Kenias Mafukize, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Alpha Media Holdings. Uh, Mr. Mafukize was um, struggling um, at the beginning of our webinar to join us um, and give opening remarks. So um, I'm handing over to him um, to give um, some remarks and also his thoughts on how this big debate um, progressed. Over to you, Ken. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Greetings, our speakers and, and our audience. It gives me pleasure to thank everyone for coming through. As already said, my name is Kenyas Mafukize. It is my singular privilege and pleasure to really thank you for joining us today on the Big Debate series, which is hosted by the Zimbabwe Independent and Heart and Soul. We are sincerely delighted that you could join us and, and to join us with your thoughts, not to join us to agree. Because I think when we share openly our varied thoughts, therein lies our strength together. The ability to tolerate different views from different perspectives. The discussions were informative to me and indeed emotive in some respects because we're dealing with very important issues here. The big debate series seeks to hold robust, fact-filled debates on relevant issues affecting our society. These deliberations we trust will enable all of us to make better reasoned decisions informed by facts. It is not our intention to make the debates and our conversations political one way or the other, but it is our sincere hope that our leaders can take note and feel the pulse of the country because the people who come to our debates are sharing real life experiences and are looking upstairs for leadership. So we believe that in, in Honorable Miti, in Honorable Eddie Cross, they've taken notes and they will take these for the betterment of our country. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we collectively cast our crystal ball in what awaits us in terms of economic prospects in 2021. My own feeling is despite the relentless 
attack by COVID-19, this is indeed an exciting year in many respects. There's a large expectation that the global economy will rebound by around 3%, ironically led by China, which might even grow by 8%, which will account for 30% of this growth. Guess what? I think 2021, the electric car will transition the globe from over-reliance on fossil oils. And the electric cars are going to become no. Thanks to another fellow African, Elon Musk, who is now the richest man on the planet, almost with 200 billion. So today we also are thankful, in my view, that we will literally bid farewell to Trump. And hopefully with him, with his Trumpism momentum, it actually took an attempted coup it capital you, you itself for Americans to realize that the whole world, what the whole world knew before you were selected, which is that in a real world, we need each other. In a real world, we can't have Trump's kind of relationship to relationships to facts and to teamwork. We need each other. That's how we grow. So it is with this in mind that I'm excited that we all came together. And allow me to thank our panelists, Gloria, Nigel, Eddie, Kipson, and, and, and Eddie Cross in, in their varied views, because in that diversity, it will allow us to think, meditate, and then make informed decisions. So I, I, I leave today, Mobile, very thankful to you for hosting this debate. Thankful to our panelists. Thanks to the audience for coming in. What was interesting, which is why I only came in late, was that, um, in fact, this was oversubscribed way before we could join in. And I think in our African culture, you if you are the host, you only eat last. So the room was filled before we could even do anything. And the Facebook is buzzing everything because people want to relate and understand where we are going. So thank you so much. Uh, we will continue to bring this series forward with topics that will make us sweat a little because as society, we must talk and be open to each other. So I look forward to an engaging and rewarding year filled with kindness. Let's think of the next person. Let's realize that we only grow when we grow together. And I thank you and hand you back to you, uh, Madam MC. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mafukize. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Executive Officer of Alpha Media Holding. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have, of course, come to the end of our first installment of uh, the big debate series. Uh, we had quite uh, lively um, contributions from our panelists, very hard hitting views were shared. Um, and also ladies and gentlemen, some solutions were provided. Uh, we hope that our government will be able to um, implement some of these solutions. We were given some um, truths about what uh, the prospects are for our economy for 2021. And um, of course, uh, the message of hope and togetherness that has been shared uh, by Kenya is that in order for us to go further, let us go together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the power challenges, in spite of the technical issues, we managed to host a, a successful uh, debate. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with us. And we definitely look forward to welcoming you to the next series, uh, which we will advertise on our various platforms and also on the print media. To the panelists, thank you very much uh, for being with us and also to our audience joining us on the Zoom platform on Facebook, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you so much for being engaged and thank you for your contributions. From Alpha Media Holdings and of course from Heart and Soul TV and Zimbabwe Independent, we wish you have a pleasant day and enjoy the rest of, of uh, your week. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.